Wow. If you had told me a year ago that I'd be up here doing this, I would have said you're crazy. But praise God. <laughs> hey, church. My name is Lewis Miller. I was born in a strong Christian family, and I was baptized when I was 14 years old. When I was 18 years old, I moved to college, and that began 30 years of living a homosexual lifestyle. I always struggled in the beginning with my faith, and I felt like Christianity was the party I was not invited to. I sort of created my own denomination, I call it loophole Christianity, and sort of found all the loopholes, like, you know, it's all about how you interpret the scripture, or this applies to you but not to me, or Paul didn't really mean that when he said that in Romans, but it was all just ways of skirting the issue. As time went on, I traded God for lowercase g gods, and chiefly those were the God of my career and success and the God of beauty. And in fact, I, it was actually my business motto in constant pursuit of beauty. Beautiful travel, beautiful people, beautiful homes, beautiful interiors. I felt like if I couldn't have God, I could have beauty, and that ran parallel in my mind. After a while, the beauty stopped being beautiful. The God-shaped hole started to rear its head. As the years progressed, my loophole Christianity turned into agnosticism, which ultimately then to stoicism, which I kind of liked for a while because it had all the common sense of Christianity without the annoying emotion, and then straight into full-on atheism. And for a while, you know, being an atheist gave me freedom. I was free to marry a man. I was free to live my life the way I wanted to, not like I wasn't already, to be honest, but there wasn't a guy in the sky writing down everything that I was doing wrong and going to hold me accountable for it later. So it did give me a sense of freedom in the beginning. But the problem was I missed God because God never let me go. He remembered my commitment to him when I was 14 years old, getting baptized in the Tuolumne River in Modesto, California. And he grew this discontent more and more in me. And suddenly, the gods of hedonism and epicureanism and the pursuit of beauty became meaningless. Fast forward to 2020, life was great. Um, I was engaged to be married to a man. I um, had a beautiful home. I had great dogs. Business was booming. I had plenty of income to satisfy my every whim. And that's really what my life had become about. Like, how can I please myself now? What cocktail party are we going to? What, what amazing trip are we going to take, take next? What more can we buy or shop or wear? And it got to the point, I was like, I just, I can't do this anymore. I can't do another brunch. And <laughs> if I've then 2020 and COVID hit, and COVID really made me stop flat in my tracks and reevaluate everything. It was a scary time for business, but you know what? It made me go in deep and examine what my morals were, what my principles were. Did I actually have them? Did I actually have a, a, a principles per se? And so I had to go through all the issues, and I was sort of shocked that actually my worldview really aligned with a biblical worldview. And that kind of set me, set me back a little bit. And then I proceeded to just be in a bad mood for about two years. Because <laughs> then I was stuck in New York. Fast forward to June of 22. I woke up one morning. It was a Sunday. My partner, who I was living with at the time, was in Los Angeles for work. And I thought, let me go to church. You know, I, I was so hungry for truth. It's like, let me go to church. And... I knew, like, nobody needs to know about it. He's gone. I don't have to explain it. I can come in here anonymously and just get out if it's too uncomfortable. And I had known about Times Square Church because years before, my parents had come, and they had always told me about it. And so I'm like, well, let me check out Times Square Church. And the funny thing is, is that throughout the years, the decades, I had no taste for progressive Christianity or gay-affirming churches. Like, it didn't ring true to me. And I honestly think, to be honest, I think I might even check the TSC website to make sure there wasn't a rainbow flag because it was years earlier when my parents went and a lot of things had happened. So for all I knew, they had you know, joined the, the crowd. 
I sat right over there. This was Father's Day of June of 2022. And I sat right over there, and I was so amazed to walk in and literally see the streets of New York all in one place with the sole purpose of praising God. And it was, it blew my mind. I hadn't seen so much joy. And, you know, leaving the debauchery and the hedonism that June is, that New York is in the month of June, all that garbage stayed outside. That was not in this room. And then the preacher came out. <laughs> And it was truth bomb after truth bomb after truth bomb after truth bomb. And I was just sucking it up. I was absorbing it. And finally, I made my way down here. I did the altar call. And at one point, he looked at me and he said, there are those of you in this room who the only thing between you and the gates of hell is a praying mother and a praying father. And I was like... I knew it was for me. It was incredible. It was, it was a life-changing moment. And then I didn't go back for a year. I knew if I came back here, I would be too convicted and I would have to make a change. I wanted to just chalk this off as a fun experience, move on with my life. I knew I'd have to, it would be embarrassing, it would be messy, I would have to break up a relationship. But God knew what I did that day. And he made the next 12 months very uncomfortable for me. And this God-shaped hole got bigger and bigger and bigger. And finally, a year later, my relationship had dissolved. I was single, I was on my own. And about a year to the date, back over there, I made my way here. And that was when I gave my sexuality to Christ. And I'm like, I don't know how I'm gonna do this. I don't have the ability to white knuckle this or uh, make these changes on my own, you're going to have to do it. And at one point it was just like, boom, I'm just laying this at the foot of the cross. You take it from here because it's your problem now. <laughs> and he did. It was immediate, it was insane. Within, you know, immediately all last summer, it was like decades of addiction to pornography, chain broken, like using, using sex as some weird form of validation and power, chain broken. But the most amazing thing was my identity. You know, my identity as a gay man was, was chain broken. My identity, like, it was, I'm now a child of the king. I am not a gay man. I am a child of the king. So, <laughs> I will just say that in closing, God is so good, you know, I no longer, I no longer search and I'm not in constant pursuit of beauty anymore, you know, I'm in constant pursuit of holiness because beauty already found me. Beauty was in constant pursuit of me and he never let me go and beauty, that was Jesus. So, thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Valerie, and I would like to share with you how the Lord saved me. From 1980 to 2008, I was addicted to cocaine. I was, for 28 years of my life, I struggled with this dark secret. I hid it from my children, my family, and everyone around me because I was so ashamed. I was what you would call a functioning drug addict. I kept my outer appearance up. I had a decent and well-kept home for my children. I always made sure that they were safe, fed, clothed well. I went to work every day functioning on as little as two hours of sleep for years, and I had a 6 a.m. shift. Talking about God having mercy on me, I don't know how I didn't pass out or something. I didn't miss days of work, but I also did not miss days of doing drugs. You can count it on one hand, very few. From the outside, you wouldn't know because I covered it so well, but on the inside, I was dying. Something was wrong with me and I knew it. I didn't like the person I had become. In 1987, I became pregnant with my second child. I felt the best thing to do with that baby was to abort it. With my life and my marriage being a mess and in turmoil, I was drug addicted and lonely. Because I was already doing the best I could to take care of my son, I didn't want to bring another child into my mess onto this world. I thought that that baby would be better off if it wasn't born. So at seven and a half months pregnant, I made up my mind to go through with this abortion. 
On the day of the scheduled abortion, the appointment was set up, the procedure was explained, and I was ready. So I got up, got ready, and I kid you not, when I set my feet on the ground for the very first time, I felt full movement in my stomach from this baby. I mean, this baby would not stop moving. I remember holding my stomach and just sitting back down and crying, realizing that the baby was alive in me. I thought the baby wasn't even alive. I was doing so much drugs and I was so numb, I couldn't feel anything. So as I was holding my stomach, that's when God spoke to me. He said, take care of this child. At that moment, I felt close to the baby, and all I wanted to do was hold and take care of the baby inside of me. So I didn't go through with the abortion. <laughs> Praise God. Instead of going to the abortion clinic, that same day I went to the hospital to get help. I hadn't had any prenatal care or anything. I hadn't taken very good care of myself or the baby. I was afraid to go to the hospital because I thought that once they found out I had drugs in my system, that they would lock me up. But when I went to the hospital, they actually did find the drugs and they realized that it was unsafe for me and the baby. So after they did some tests, they induced my labor and my baby girl was born at four pounds and 13 ounces. She had fully developed lungs, no drugs in her system and was breathing on her own. I was doing drugs the whole time, so only God could have did that. They were watching me in the hospital, and I knew they were watching me, and I didn't want them to take my baby from me, so I made sure that I was on my best behavior. I was determined to bring my baby home and to prove myself a good mother and not the mother that walked in there drug addicted. I remember the day when she was being released from the hospital to go home, and they were congratulating me and my baby. So I took my baby home, and I don't know if it was days, a week, or a month. I don't know when it started again, but it did. I started getting high again. I tried to cut down on the amount of drugs I was doing so that I could be able to function enough to be able to take care of my baby. But who knows, if I had to continue to consume the amount of drugs that I was doing, I could have probably had an overdose or something. But I remember God saying to me, take care of this child. And that thought never left me. I made New Year's resolutions and promises, but, but only to find myself five minutes later back in the bathroom taking another hit. Oh, maybe tomorrow I'll stop. I even tried to take up hobbies, but in all of my self-effort, I failed. I hated the drugs. I hated what I had become. I remember sitting in the bathroom with the drugs in my hand and looking at it, dreading what I was about to do. I wanted something to just stop me. I didn't know that you could even talk to God or pray to God when you were in a mess like that. I thought you had to clean yourself up, carry a Bible, and look and act a certain way before you could even set foot in the church. So I remember thinking about God and hoping that he didn't see me and that he would turn away from me and not look at me when I was doing the drugs. But thank God he didn't turn away from me. Hallelujah. I wanted to be a good mother and a better person, but I didn't know how to make myself better. I remember beginning to feel so uncomfortable with myself. One day I was hungover and tired as usual at work, but this particular day I decided I was going to get help. But for me to even to begin to think that way, it had to be God bringing me to the end of myself. I knew that my job had a rehab program where you can get help and still keep your job. But when I finally worked up the nerve to call the, the numbers that they gave me, uh, they rejected me. The last number I called even hung up the phone on me. But that brought me to my knees. I fell on my knees. I remember falling on my knees, looking up, screaming, I need you, I need you, I cannot do this without you. And I mind you, I don't even know who I was talking to. But after I cried to God, he miraculously delivered me. He took away the desire for the drugs, the alcohol, and the cigarettes after 28 years of addiction. Praise God, thank you, Jesus. God met me. He met me on a hotel room, on the floor, on the floor. He came down for me. I didn't have to work my way up, and you don't either. He came down for you. Hallelujah. Mark 2, 17, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. I was sick. I was sick. So after God delivered me, I felt clean enough to come to church. So I called out of work and ended up here at TSC on Resurrection Sunday, 2009. My first time in church in years. That Easter Sunday, 2009, I gave my life to Jesus. God saved me. My life has never been the same. God changed my life so miraculously that my daughter thought I was going crazy. So she started following me here because she thought 
I was in a cult and was being brainwashed or something. So after her visiting this church several times, one day she got up and came to the altar and gave her heart to Jesus. So in 2009, we both got baptized here on the same day. My daughter, the picture, my daughter is a Summit alumni. She graduated from Summit International School of Ministry in 2014. Has a beautiful relationship with the Lord. I can't even imagine my life without her. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for not allowing me to destroy my daughter's life. God saved us both, and it's mind-blowing how he did it. God took my shame away, and now I can tell everybody what Jesus has done for me. Somebody had to be praying for me, so I'm praying for you. We're praying and believing God for a billion souls to be saved. And guess what? You're one of those souls we believe in God for. Let me pray for you. Hallelujah. For this cause... Since the day we heard it, I do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all Lord suffering and joyfulness and giving thanks unto the Father who has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the powers of darkness and that's translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, Jesus Christ. I'm praying for you. I'm believing God to do for you what he did for me. Right where you are. God bless you. Wrapping up the evening, you know, God has been speaking throughout this whole evening, through the worship, through the songs, through the testimony, through everything that's been happening this evening. And, and I was just thinking, you know, the Lord gives a new life to those who come to him. It's a supernatural change. We were just singing super, 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 <laughs> super supernatural power. It's a supernatural change that begins to happen. What you heard from Lewis tonight, what you heard from Valerie tonight is a supernatural change. And, and I'm sure there are plenty of people around you. If you look to your left, your right, in front of you, behind you, people's lives have been supernaturally changed. Yeah. Folks, God is real. I was thinking, you, have you ever wanted to start something all over again? Have you ever wished you could get another shot at something? I think about when I was in high school, I used to play basketball, and I played for uh, one of the top programs in the city in a Catholic school. We had gone my freshman year, my sophomore year, my uh, junior year, senior year, we went to the city championship all four years, four years straight. One year we won, one year we lost, the next year we won, the next year we lost. But, we, but uh, every year we went to the championship, and, uh, and I remember, I was in a game one time and my dad had come and it was the first game he had ever come to. And I had to shoot, I had gotten fouled, uh, which means I would go to the line and I would get two free shots. And I remember being just so nervous because my dad was there and it was quiet and, and I went to shoot my first shot and it was an air ball, it didn't touch anything. <laughs> it fell right short of the rim and I remember feeling like mortified. I just wanted to die and I wanted that shot back and thank God I made the second shot but I, I felt so embarrassed but my dad was super gracious. After the game he smiled <laughs> and drove us home. Growing up I was fortunate to have a, a good father who was kind and who loved me uh, but you may not have had that kind of privilege of having such a father. But tonight I want to speak to you about a heavenly father whose love and kindness you can experience. He can give you a new life tonight, just as you've been hearing this evening. You know, Lewis and Valerie, what they experienced was supernatural as they came to God, as they began to call on him, as they began to come to him he gave them a new life. And God is no respecter of persons, which means it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've been through, what your background is.
God knows you. He knows your name. He's numbered every hair on your head, or in my case, whatever is not there. <laughs> whatever used to be there, it was numbered. <laughs> The Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 10 through 13, it says this. It says, but although the world was made through him, speaking of Jesus, the world didn't recognize him when he came. Even in his own land and among his own people, he was not accepted. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn. It's not a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan. This birth comes from God. Folks, God created us for a relationship with himself. We are all unique. You are unique. You are one of a kind. As a matter of fact, I want you to turn to your neighbor on your left and tell him that right now. You are one of a kind. You are unique. <laughs> Folks, we're all different. We have different likes and dislikes. Some of us like rice and beans. Other, others of us like spaghetti and meatballs. Some of us like fried chicken wings and pork fried rice. <laughs> Some of us like barbecue ribs, mac and cheese, and collard greens. Some of us like sushi. I don't know why, but some of us like sushi. My wife likes sushi. <laughs> Others of us like tandoori chicken and basmati rice, chicken tikka masala, chicken pad thai. We are all different. We have different personalities, different giftings, different talents. As a matter of fact, the scripture says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made by God. You were made by God and for God. Now consider the fact that we were created in the image of the God of the universe. A few days ago, everybody was looking at the eclipse and their attention was drawn to what was actually happening in the universe around us. You know, the God who made all these things made you, and he made me. And we can't even fathom how amazing he is. Nature, though, gives us glimpses from time to time. I think about a trip that my wife and I had the opportunity to go on. We, we, went to, we flew to Arizona, and we went to see the Grand Canyon. How many of you heard of the Grand Canyon? It's one of the wonders of the world. We had an opportunity to go there. We took a helicopter, flew into the Grand Canyon, flew around inside, and then came back out and landed. And it was amazing as we were looking at this wonder of the world. It was breathtaking, folks. It was breathtaking. Then I began to imagine how awesome the one who made all this must be. As a matter of fact, the scripture tells us in Psalm 8, verse 1 and through 4, it says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When I consider the heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you would care for him? What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you would care for him? Yet he created us. He created man so that we could have a relationship with him. Folks, I'm talking about an intimate relationship, not some God who's intangible, intangible who's out there in the cosmos somewhere, but I'm talking about an intimate relationship with him. We were created for a relationship with God. But man sinned, the Bible tells us. What is sin? Sin is living independently from God. 
Sin is everything you and I do that is contrary to God's law, God's commandments. John chapter 1 verse 11 says, He came to his own creation and his own people did not receive him. Folks, this passage of scripture is, a very exa- is an example of that very thing. I think of how America has been called a postmodern or post-Christian society. Today, if a person holds a biblical worldview, they are vilified. Jesus said, if the world hates you, understand that it hated me first. Anyone who is associated with Christ, aka a Christian, is considered a bigot, a racist, intolerant, an anarchist, a threat to this godless and progressive agenda. You can see that still today, Christ is rejected. His name is a curse word. The human heart is still at enmity with God. Man is still captivated by sin. Despite all his progress and intellectual advancement, That is why this world is so messed up. There's greed, corruption, violence, misery, shame, pain. There's fear, anxiety everywhere. Abuses of all kinds, sexual, emotional, physical, verbal. There's murder, suicides, racism, selfishness, despair, and the list goes on and on. And these things were introduced, all introduced to the world after man chose to make choices independent of God, as man chose to sin, as man chose to say, no, God, I'm going to do things my way in the garden. The Bible tells us all have sinned and fall short of God's holy standard, all of us. God dwells in unapproachable light. In him there is no darkness at all. He is altogether other than us. He is holy and good, and he is in a class all by himself. Yet we've all inherited that sinful, that sinful nature, the capacity to make wrong choices, to do wrong from our first parents, Adam and Eve. The Bible gives us plenty of examples of this and what's found in man's hearts from evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, eagerness for lustful pleasure, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. And it tells us that the wages and the penalty for our sins is death. What does this death look like? What does it speak of? It speaks of a spiritual death for you and I. It means that we're cut off from the abundant life that God alone can give. We're left to be governed by our natural senses, touch, taste, hearing, right? These things under God's wrath bound for hell, but there's hope. I said there's hope. (laughs) There's a new life in Jesus Christ. In other words, you and I can be saved, given a new beginning, a fresh start. That's what salvation is. It means to be saved from the wrath of God and set apart for God, set apart to God. You now belong to God. We don't have to go to hell. We don't have to live live in a living hell. Hallelujah. We're talking about being saved or salvation, which is having our sins forgiven and receiving eternal life. The Bible says in John 3, 16, and I like how it puts it in the amplified version. It says, for God so greatly loved the world. He so greatly loved you tonight. Someone might have invited you, a colleague, a coworker, a neighbor, a family member, or maybe you just wandered in here like Lewis did. The Bible says God so greatly loved you that he even gave up his only begotten son so that whoever believes in, trusts and clings to, relies on him shall not perish. In other words, come to destruction or be lost, but have 
eternal, everlasting life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. John 1, 12 in the Amplified says this, but to as many as receive and welcome him, he gives the authority, the power, the privilege to become children of God. That is to those who believe who adhere to, trust in, and rely on his name and his name alone. Verse 13 in the NLT says, They are reborn, not a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, as we said earlier, but a birth, a rebirth that comes from God. It's supernatural, folks. It's a supernatural change. We're not talking to you about religion tonight. We're talking to you about a supernatural change that comes from the hand of God Almighty. He's the one you've been searching for. He's the one you've been looking for tonight. A supernatural transformation that takes place. You become a new person. The old life becomes history and a new life begins. You become a partaker of God's divine nature. You get a new life, a fresh start, folks. Folks, I think of how from an early age I always felt like God had a plan for my life, a purpose. This was a seed that I believe God planted in my heart, but I never knew how I would get there. I was raised a Catholic, but there was Catholicism in my house and there was also witchcraft, voodoo, because my parents come from Haiti. I'm first generation American, I was born and raised here, but. Those habits, those practices followed us here. And so there was this mixture in my house. So it opened the door to darkness and fear and anxiety and hopelessness and curses and evil and the demonic. I went to church as a child because they put me in a Catholic school, as I mentioned earlier. I did all my sacraments. But nonetheless, I was still bound by sin, miserable and fearful about the future. I went from relationship to relationship. I tried drugs, alcohol, partying, bodybuilding, but I was still empty on the inside. Then Jesus came and found me. (laughs) And in one day, folks, in one day, He broke the darkness over my life and saved my soul. Had a young man, to make a long story short, that we had become best friends in college. We were workout partners. We used to bodybuild. That might be hard to believe right now looking at me. We used to bodybuild. We used to compete. I actually had a girlfriend who was a bodybuilder as well. And we were training and preparing for a couples contest. And then one day, my friend invited me to his house. His dad was a pastor. And I sat in his living room. And his dad came out and began to speak to us. I was, I'll never forget the day. I was on the sofa. I was sitting in the middle seat in the sofa. Um, my girlfriend was sitting right here. My girlfriend at the time, my friend's girlfriend was sitting right here. My friend was sitting right here in a, 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 a chair, and his dad was sitting across from us. And he began to speak to us about the good news of Jesus Christ, like I'm sharing with you tonight. How your life can change, and how God has a plan for your life, and how he created us for more than this. But how our sins have separated us from him, but how Jesus came and paid the ultimate price for our sins. And folks, I've got to tell you. As he began to speak, all of a sudden, it was like missing pieces of the puzzle started to come together in my mind. An understanding, a revelation started to come. And now suddenly I understood more than I ever understood before. And by the time he was done, all the pieces clicked together in my mind of this puzzle. And right before my eyes, I saw a picture, and it was supernatural, of Jesus on the cross. And for the very first time in my life, I felt the love of God. 
And I understood in that moment that God loved me. I began to hear a voice telling me, this is crazy, this is nuts. But then suddenly, the pastor stood up, my friend's dad stood up, and he said, if you want this Jesus, if you want this new life, you can stand right now, we're going to pray. And I heard a voice in my head saying, don't do it, you've got your own religion, what's your parents going to think, what's everybody going to think? But folks, I got to tell you, I knew in my gut that what I was hearing was the truth. I knew instinctively that this is what I've been searching for my whole life. I began to weep because I felt God's love. It was personal now. But of course, my girlfriend was there, so I was trying to be macho and hold it in. <laughs> but I started crying all the more. And then suddenly, I looked at my girlfriend, and she was crying. And then I looked at my friend's girlfriend, and she was crying. And I looked at my friend, and he was crying. And then his dad said, stand up. And so I stood up. And that day, I responded, and I prayed a prayer, what was called and known as the sinner's prayer, acknowledging my sin and that I need God and that I want him in my life. And folks, that was 38 years ago, October the 10th, on a Friday evening, 1986, and I have never been the same since. I had a young person ask me one time at the altar, say at the altar one time, I hope this works. Folks, I want you to know it works. <laughs> it works. Tonight can be your night. Tonight is your night for a miracle, for a change. God set this whole night up for you. He set it up for you. Wherever you're seating tonight, he set this whole night up for you. Two last things I want to share with you before we pray. I like what one person wrote. He said this. He said, when Jesus, came, uh, Jesus Christ comes into our lives, he comes to live within us. He takes our emptiness and he feeds us and fills us, sustains us, and he satisfies us. He takes our anxiety and he gives us peace of mind and of heart, not like the world. He takes our unhappiness, our misery, and he fills us with joy until it overflows. And he takes our lack of power. And Christ comes and he gives you the strength you need. Just like Lewis said, you don't have to white knuckle this thing. God will supernaturally change you. Just like Valerie said, you can fall on your knees before him and suddenly... Life-controlling habits can be broken. Addictions can be broken. Depression can be broken. P porn addiction can be broken. Alcoholism can be broken. The nightmares from past abuse can be broken. Freedom can be your portion tonight. I read this quote today in my devotions, and it said this. It says, if you've run from God, ignored his good design, disregarded his warnings, purposely rebelled against him, or simply chose to forget his existence altogether, it's not too late to turn back. God doesn't ignore those who come to him. He doesn't dismiss those with a humble and repentant heart. He is patiently and faithfully waiting for those who will return to him. Tonight, will you accept him? Will you receive him? Will you give him your life? Bruised, battered, broken by sin, will you make him your Lord and Savior? 
If you do, he will give you the right, the power to become a child of God. Would you bow your heads with me all over this house tonight? Tonight, if you'd say, Pastor, I've heard the testimonies. I've heard the songs. I've heard what you've shared. And maybe you've wandered away from the Lord. You've been backslidden or you've held back from him. You've not completely surrendered to him. And you say, Pastor, that's me. Would you pray for me? Would you pray for me, Pastor? If that's you, all over this house, would you raise your hand tonight? Amen. Keep going. It's okay. You're not alone. Raise your hand tonight. I see hands over here, in the back over here, in the middle section over here as well. If you've not been living for God and, and maybe you've never been born again, which is what God calls this new life. He calls it being born again. If you say, Pastor, that's me. And you say, Pastor, I don't want religion. I want a relationship with God. I want new life, the new life that he gives. If you say, that's me, Pastor, I want you to raise your hand tonight all over this place. Okay, I see a couple of other hands going up tonight. In a moment, we're gonna stand. In a moment, we're gonna stand quietly and reverently. And as we do, I'm gonna invite those of you who raised your hand and those of you who didn't, who should have raised your hand, to join me at the front of this church, what we call an altar. And we're gonna pray together. We're not gonna do anything weird. We're gonna pray together and we're gonna believe God for supernatural change in your life tonight. Let's all stand quietly and reverently. If you say, Pastor, that's me, you raised your hand. Step out of your seat. Those that are next to you, they're going to make a way for you, for you to come up to the front here, and we're going to pray. We're going to believe God for a miracle for you tonight. Tonight's your night for change. Tonight's your night for a miracle. You can come from the sides. Come down the altar. Come from the back, this side here. Keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. Keep coming. This is your night for a miracle. This is your night for a transformation. This is your night for a new beginning. This is your night for a supernatural change. What you have not been able to do, God will do for you tonight. He's going to set you free tonight. Somebody's going to get a new mommy tonight. Somebody's going to get a new daddy tonight. Somebody's going to get a new auntie tonight. Somebody's going to get a new son tonight. Hallelujah. Somebody's going to get a new daughter tonight. Hallelujah, hallelujah. He's here. God's here tonight. This is your night. Your heart might be beating a thousand miles a minute, folks. If that's you tonight, if you hear his voice, don't resist him tonight. This is your night. This is your night. This is your night. Don't let the devil, don't let anything, don't let fear of man, don't let anything rob you of this evening, of this moment. This is your night for a miracle tonight. Hallelujah. You matter tonight. You matter tonight. As a matter of fact, the Bible says God will leave the 90 and 9 sheep that are doing well and he will go after the one. The one. The one. That's you tonight. The one. That's you tonight. That's you tonight. He wants to set you free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus called it being born again. How does that happen? We like to say it's as simple as A, B, C. A stands for admit. Admit that you have sinned. Admit that you have not always done things God's way. Admit that you have lived your life doing what seemed right to you, but not necessarily to God. B stands for believe. Believe that God was willing to sacrifice his son out of love for you. Believe that he did this so that the penalty of your sin and mine could be paid for, satisfied, so that we could be forgiven. And C stands for confess. 
confess Jesus as Lord. Lord means he's now in charge. He is the boss. Hallelujah. We're going to pray tonight. For the sake of those who are responding to the Lord tonight, let's all pray together, nice and loud. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that on the cross, you took my sin, my guilt, and my shame, and you died for it. I believe that you defeated sin and death and that I have the victory because of you. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. Now I declare with confidence that God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper, and heaven is now my home. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. God loves you so much so that there is a party taking place in heaven right now on your behalf. The Bible says that the angels of God are celebrating and rejoicing, but that God too is rejoicing on your behalf because he loves you so much. He loves you so much tonight. Folks, would you stretch forth your hand towards these that have responded? We're going to pray for chains to be broken tonight. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the authority that you've given us as believers to pray for one another. We exercise that authority and we're believing tonight that chains will be broken, that bondages will be loosed. Lord, that you'll bring healing where there is pain, Lord, where there is sorrow, where there is grief, where there has been loss. God, we're believing that you will comfort. Lord, we're believing for the clouds of despair and depression to be broken tonight in the name of Jesus. Let all oppression go tonight in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that you would fill every person that has responded here with your power. God, power to live right, power to talk right, power to worship you, power to pursue you, power to love you, power to seek you, power to honor you, the rest of their days. God, we thank you that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Hallelujah. 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 We shout unto God with the voice of triumph. We shout unto God with the voice of praise. Hallelujah. 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 Tonight, if you're beginning your journey with the Lord, with God tonight, we want you to take a moment to text the word decided to 51,000, decided to 51,000. We want to help you with your next steps. You're not meant to do this alone. There's a body, there's an army, the army of God, and you have now signed up. <laughs> Welcome to the family of God. Welcome to the body of Christ. He loves you and he's going with you. You're not leaving him here. You're rolling with Jesus now. I said you're rolling with Jesus now. <laughs> he's got you. Amen. God bless you. Folks, what an incredible night it's been. We need to go rejoicing. We need to go shouting and praising. I'm going to turn it over to Elder Vicky and the worship team tonight. God bless you as we go rejoicing in Jesus' name.